So good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us today for the second of the Art for the Environment Conversations 2021. My name is Camilla Palestra. I'm a curator. I work at the uh, Center for Sustainable Fashion at UAL, where I've been developing together with Lucy Orta the International Residency Program Art for the Environment. The program was launched in 2015 um, as a way to offer UL students and alumni the opportunity to apply to a fully funded residency to explore concerns that define the 21st century, from biodiversity to environmental sustainability, social economy and social justice. We started in 2015 with only two um, partners and we now have an incredible network um, of international hosts from Brazil to India, from Senegal to Canada, across Europe and um, the UK. So I thought that in, in, in a moment when the physical presences are suspended due to the restrictions um, because of the global pandemic of COVID-19, I thought it would be a good opportunity to invite some of our partners and residents to come together and reflect on their experiences and on their creative role uh, in envisioning a world of tomorrow. Our guests today are Simon Beckman, Matt Parker and Stephen Bennett. Let me just um, briefly introduce the, uh, the speakers before handing over to them. So Simon is a co-founder and curator of Joya Arte Plus Ecologia, a residency for international artists and writers in the heart of the Parque Natural Sierra Maria Los Velas in the north of the province of Almeria in Andalusia, Spain. He is a researcher, activist, artist and designer. He studied fine art at Manchester Polytechnic and received his MFA at the Royal Academy Schools in London. Matt Parker is a sonospheric investigator, an artist researching the resonances between things. His research engages with sound studies, media ecology, field recording and geo-humanities through a critical and spectral art practice. His PhD from the London College of Communication at UAL investigated the relationship between internet infrastructures and the Anthropocene. He is currently a research fellow at Oxford Brookes University. And finally, we have Stephen Bennett, who is an artist and policymaker whose work explores the intersection between art, science and politics. His work explores whether art can bridge the gap between science and public decision making. Data visualization and maps are point of departure, taking information from electronic and relatively inaccessible data repositories and presenting it in an analog, tangible and interactive formats. He works in a participatory and interactive way, increasing agency and engagement in evidence. Stephen holds an MA Art and Science from Central St. Martins at UAL. Greetings from Spain, everybody. Um, firstly, I'd like to thank Lucy Orta and Camilla Palestra for inviting me to this Art for the Environment conversation. Hoya Arte Ecologia Air has had a long association with UAL, and we have had many students and alumni in residence with us over the years. It has been great to be part of the Art for the Environment International Artist Residency Program. We have hosted many exceptional artists through this initiative, not least Matt Parker and Stephen Bennett, who you're about to hear from. While I'm here, I'd like to give a shout out to Helen Barnett from UAL CSM MA in Art and Science, who annually brings her students to us on field trips. It's always a fantastic residency with great students. I have to say that we are very well aware that as a consequence of the residencies we have here, many artists and writers who come to Hoya have a transformative experience in this special environment. It's not something we take lightly, hopefully can explain why. So we've been asked to reflect on our creative role in visiting, in visiting a world of tomorrow. Well, Donna and I keenly see our role as practicing artists and creators at OER 
to facilitate creativity in all its aspects in an environment here in Spain that is, as you can see from the image, extremely fragile, extremely fascinating, but in jeopardy from desertification as it's on the front line of climate change. We do this by living off grid and being climate positive. Being off grid means we have a connection to utilities from our nearest municipality, which is 14 kilometers away across mountainous dirt tracks. For energy, we use photovoltaic panels and a wind turbine for electricity. We have solar panels for hot water. We harvest rainwater from the roof. We, we recycle domestic water for use on the land, filtered through a complicated system of reed beds. And we plant trees to offset remaining carbon emissions. The approximately 700 artists we've hosted here engage with this example of sustainable living. At an elevation of a thousand meters, our landscape is subtropical Mediterranean land. So it's cold in winter, hot in summer, and incredibly dry. Our initial problem was to sustainably make arid and abandoned land productive again. The only way to do this is to have a water resource. To achieve this, we started with substantial earthworks in two manifestations. Firstly, as you can see in this photograph, we have used permaculture design principles to build a series of swales and berms for water catchment around Hoya. A swale is a ditch on a slope dug on contour. Rainfall accumulates in the ditch and it is slowly absorbed into the ground to create a resource for trees planted further down the slope. As a consequence, this design has allowed us to plant in the region of 150 fruiting trees for food and for carbon offset. Secondly, we started the restoration of an ancient water catchment system on our land, dating back to the time of the wars. It's called the Cañada y Boquera. The Cañada is a naturally formed gully with giant man-made earthworks which traverse its width, putting the brakes on rainwater runoff. The accumulated water then fills a balsa or pond in a way I shall explain. The Boquera is an ancient system of distribution of water for agriculture. So as a consequence of restoring the Cañada, we are able to restore the balsa or pond into a natural swimming space. It's in two parts. Zone one is the swimming pond and zone two is the regeneration pond full of aquatic plants which filter and clean the water which is circulated between the two zones. In turn, the balsa or pond is then used to irrigate our organic vegetable garden, providing fresh produce for resident artists at Hoya. It's also a good place to cool down in the summer when the temperature reaches 38 degrees centigrade or more. In addition, we have started creating a food forest. Apart from the trees we have planted on our key line design, we have an ancient system of terraces, which we've restored for the benefit of planting fruiting trees. Next winter, we hope to be able to plant in the region of 250 trees, in addition to the 150 we have planted in the last two years. It's important to note that the design and restoration of water catchment systems is co-evolutive. In other words, the slow regeneration of groundwater becomes beneficial to flora and fauna, as well as to our community. And the, the restoration of water catchment systems also informs my own painting practice and my interest in the unseen and modulating dynamic flow of hydrologic cycles. My practice does not distinguish between the research, understanding and restoration of dryland water catchment systems and my painting. The Developers Garden is a new initiative. We're very pleased to announce here our collaboration with the London Alternative Photography Collective. With LAPC founder Melanie King, who I believe is here, and co-director Hannah Fletcher, both UAL alumni, Hoya has been realizing plans to create a developer's garden. The connection here is that Melanie was the Hoya selected artist for the 2019 Art for the Environment Residency Program. The idea is to use permaculture design principles to cultivate plants which can be used as sustainable alternatives to photographic film and printing. And post-COVID, we invite members of LAPC to be in residence and use the nursery in their practice. In addition, we have a newly instated analog dark room studio at artist's disposal. Rewilding, that's a turtle dove you see on our property here. So given the nature of our cultural and sustainable activities, it occurred to us that our resident artists might benefit more from us returning the land to the native steppe ecology found here 200 years ago. This would be an alternative to conventional cereal agriculture. 
it is evident that encounters with native flora and fauna are going to be more beneficial to us and our resident artists, both economically and experientially. We are 20 hectares within a natural park of 22,000 hectares. To the east in the province of Murcia, there is a Spanish lynx reintroduction scheme. To the north, we have the empty high plains, which lead to Andalusia's biggest natural park in Cazorla, where there is a bearded vulture reintroduction scheme. Combined with other native fauna, we are uniquely placed to be a bridging post between these areas. This is an ongoing discussion we are having with the Natural Park Authority. The restoration of wildlife in this environment and the consequences of their rehabilitation or rehabilitation will restore the landscape back to a wild place. Sender is another new initiative. Sender is to be a trail of interventions within the landscape. Contemporary art, creative thought and ideas will meander through the pine forested sierras, the clay bottomed barrancos and the fossil strewn dry riverbeds of the ramblers. The trail is not a transect or survey. It has no start, no finish. It needs no time, daylight or starlight, seasonal impulse. Slowly and with varying strategies, Hoya Artejo here intends to populate the trail, accumulating artworks, either ephemeral or permanent, documenting events and inviting the public to access the project. The piece you can see in this photo is our inaugural work by artist Simon Linnington. It's a glass tower of varying coloured clays from around Hoya. Simon has recently been commissioned to make a much larger version of this work in Mexico City. So in conclusion, Donna and I believe our role is not just to facilitate artists and writers, but more importantly, be exemplars to sustainable living, to bring inspiration to artists, and in turn, harness the energy and inspiration artists can bring to land, which is slowly healing, despite the adversity it faces. Our legacy is to be climate activists through art and positive action. Thank you. Thank you, Simon. Um, I will pass it directly over to Matt, and then we can have questions at the end, as we said. Matt, over to you. Hi. Um, thank you, Simon. Uh, thanks, Camilla. And thanks, Abby. And also, thanks to everyone else that's here in attendance right now. Um, my name is Matt Parker, and I am an artist. Uh, I work primarily with sound and vibration. Um, I'm interested in uh, ways of listening to environments uh, and ways of thinking about um, distributed networks in environments. Um, and I'm going to share uh, just briefly, so bear with me, I'm going to share a screen um, and hopefully we can see uh, this site. This is my website. Um, actually, it's inside the back end of my website uh, because I'm going to show you some uh, journals that I took whilst I was, or that I wrote um, whilst I was uh, on my residency with Simon and his family in Spain. Um, so this is just the front page of my website. Uh, the, this work is the People's Cloud. Um, there's, there's a series of works here um, that I've made. Uh, the work I make is interested in often in the cloud or in internet infrastructures. Um, so I'm kind of interested in things like data centers and fiber optic cables and um, the history of computing technologies. Uh, this is a piece of work that was made in Hoya that we'll get back to in a moment. Um, so what I do typically with my practice is uh, field recording uh, or I use field recording. So sound, this is like sound recording or vibrational recordings or ways of experimenting with um, listening uh, to, to media through microphones and other types of sensors. Um, as a way to kind of explore and navigate space and think about the um, ecological and environmental and cultural kind of uh, relationships to this. So I'm getting here to um, the first sort of entry from the journal. Uh, so this is um, a journal that I kept whilst I was on the residency every day. I wrote a kind of breakdown of what I did and took some photos. Um, and this um, particular entry I'm going to share with you because it was kind of the foundation for the, um, I guess, like the kind of inspiration for what I was trying to explore whilst I was on the residency. Um, this quote here is taken from uh, the book Station Eleven by Hilary St. Mandel. 
uh, which was written uh, or came out um, not long before, as you can see, 2015, uh, not long before the residency that I did, which was in the kind of height of summer in 2016. You know, it was very, very hot, very, very hot indeed. Um, uh, but I was very interested in going to Hoya as a place that was, um, that, as I understood it, was an off-grid location. And I wanted to sort of think about uh, what off-grid meant and uh, what off-grid sounded like. So the idea for me, the, the intention was to, uh, as someone who had been studying things like data centers and internet infrastructure, so this kind of very sort of um, physical, heavy industry um, spaces um, that were the backbone of the internet, I was in cur curious about the prospect of going to somewhere that was off of the grid and potentially had no internet. But of course, we've seen Simon talking uh, just now and heard him talk, uh, so we know that he's connected to the internet. Um, but down um, in this space, I took the opportunity to remain disconnected to that and to think about the infrastructure of this place that was in some kind of uh, trying to kind of, um, I guess, parallel it with the fantasy of this novel, uh, Station Eleven, which was exploring this idea about there being no internet, no more social media, um, none of the kind of uh, difficulties of feeling alone in a room, no more avatars, uh, no more commenting and reading on the lives of others, uh, just the kind of general sense of um, being away. Can we, oh, sorry, hide that little thing there. So that was kind of inspiration. So I've, then I've written like these kind of fairly lengthy um, pieces of prose, which were just kind of catal like, you know, cataloging what I was getting up to. Um, so I'd like let's just move to a couple of more of these slides. So this is the second day, and this is a photo that I took, uh, which is very pixely, forgive me for that, but it was from underneath uh, the, um, the, the, the wind turbine that uh, offers one of the power options for the, for the property, for the estate. Um, and here again on the third day, what I was doing uh, a lot of the time whilst I was there was thinking about this, listening to this infrastructure of like off-grid infrastructure, what that might sound like compared to um, the highly connected infrastructures of the um, of the urban urban sprawl that I live in as someone that lives in in London. Um, this is a uh, this green sort of sticky sticky stick stuff um, tape is connecting a uh, I think a contact microphone um, to this transformer that's connected to that um, wind turbine that we just saw the image of from above. Uh, so I'm kind of like interested in kind of recording these these kind of infrastructural sounds uh, as a way of kind of not just as a way of like just cataloging them uh, or like then just playing them back to people, but as a way to record and then use these kind of experiences of listening in depth as a way to kind of ins inspire my work. Um, so this um, day four, uh, this is kind of a kind of pivotal moment in my experience of the residency um, where I decided to leave the estate um, and uh, walked up to this point here, which is um, someone will recognize as being the peak of one of the uh, mountains that uh, where, where the estate sits is inside the base of a valley. Um, and this is kind of at the top of one of the kind of peaks of the of the um, sort of hillsides, uh, which I decided to walk up to very early in the morning before it got hot, um, and it did get very hot. Um, but this moment was important for my research as I as I walked up the hill. Um, I've been taking around with me uh, sound recording equipment and also my uh, my phone. Uh, my phone had been completely disconnected. There was no signal in the valley floor. Um, I was using it really just to take photos, um, so it's kind of an easy thing to carry around for photographs. Um, and I, as I walked up this hill, I encountered uh, an ibex and a fox. Um, and then right at the top of that peak that we am just looking at here, um, I saw two vultures. And I was just a couple of meters away from these vultures, and they like, flew off into the, into the distance um, as they saw me. And I felt like I've never been so uh, like far away from, uh, like never so far away from like human anthropocenic um, uh, environment as I was at that moment. Um, and and then exactly at that moment, my phone started vibrating, 
and I looked at my phone and I realized that I had uh, five bars of 4G signal. <laughs> So on this trip to this off-grid space, um, I realized actually I was never really that far away from the um, the aerial infrastructure of, of, uh, of digital data and signals. Um, so this became kind of the feature of the next few days of my research where um, from day five onwards, this is a picture of me um, trying to uh, ex trying to get signal basically so I was go going all around the um, valley trying to find signal um, and this is kind of become uh, you know you get this uh, if you have um, speakers near a, a phone uh, you might hear this sort of a sort of sound and this is the um, sound of your phone and the electromagnetic waves that are in the air trying to connect trying to um, make a connection between each other and handshake um, and this became like a fascination of me to think about how actually forgetting about the kind of um, physical wires and cables that make up internet infrastructure, we're completely immersed constantly in this like completely radically new um, aerial infrastructure. I say radically new, um, let's, let's just say for over the last hundred years since radio was invented, um, there's been a, a massive change in the frequencies that exist in the air that we can't see, but we can um, we can sense. Um, so I'm doing a lot of work exploring sensing these kinds of frequencies. Uh, and now I'm sort of starting to think about um, in my own work as a kind of inspiration from this, uh, very briefly, because I only have 10 minutes, um, about making sensors that can um, generate their own electricity um, or that will become uh, vibrational sensors. Uh, so I'm putting, I'm growing crystals like this photo here is a crystal that I'm growing in a project to make um, piezoelectric generators, um, which are kind of inspired by um, the science fiction of Kim Stanley Robinson, uh, who wrote this trilogy about Mars. Um, where a lot of power is made by piezoelectric energy. Um, and I'm thinking about how the air can um, create vibrations on platforms that create energy. So I'm sort of trying to design and build these kind of uh, aerial energy conductors that can respond to electromagnetic radiation and produce some kind of energy output. Um, and yeah, I don't have any time to talk about this stuff, sorry. I will just leave it there. Um, hopefully, that's a bit of an insight into some of my work and what I did at the during the residency. Thanks. Thank you, Matt. Maybe you can put also um, your website into the chat so people can uh, navigate with more time through your different projects. Um, yeah. Thank, thank you so much. Um, over to you, Stephen, and then we'll reconvene for a Q and A at the end. Thank you. So um, I'm Stephen Bennett, um, I'm a multimedia artist and I'm a policy maker. I studied at MA Art and Science uh, as part of St. Martin's uh, in 2016 to 18 and I did the Hoya residency in 2017. Uh, this is uh, not a picture of me at Hoya, this is a picture of me in Hertfordshire um, but I'll come to uh, why I've got that photo there later. Um, but this is a picture of Hoya. Um, so you've, I think you've seen a version of this photo already. Um, it's, it's the end of Simon's studio. And uh, that hill up there, I think, is the same hill that Matt climbed uh, and um, had his sort of uh, moment of realization. And it was really a similar um, scenario for me. I went up this hill um, uh, probably a bit less early in the morning than Matt, to be honest. Uh, and uh, I got up there and just sort of like took it all in and I thought how on earth am I supposed to create some kind of artwork uh, in this space when the nature is so sort of intimidatingly uh, beautiful um, you know what what kind of like sort of significant contribution can I make to this and I sort of had this like you know I was feeling a bit like spaced out and I was kind of like having, having one of the classic moments of realizations and so what I did is I just started laying some stones down on the floor and um, you can sort of see it at the bottom left of this uh, image uh, over this beautiful limestone, limestone paving. And I just kind of framed the ground. So here's a photo of that. So that's the sort of 
like lovely limestone which is on top of this hill and I just kind of created this frame of stones around it and I thought well there's like there's literally nothing that I can do that's better than that that is you know just the sort of earth and, a, and an image of that I think is is kind of as much as like I can't add much to this um, went down uh, down to the bottom of the hill spoke with Simon something that I think is worth mentioning is that there's a lot of other artists who are generally out here at any one time so I sort of had an opportunity to reflect on this experience and the, and the artwork uh, with Simon and with some of the other artists there they gave me a bit of confidence in this and what I decided to do is almost sort of take um, my square that I had created at this point on the map so you can see that point with the red dot there um, and then create a square on the map. So I was uh, sort of replicating the square that I had made on the ground on the map. And then I went to every single point of that square, the sort of nine points that you can make uh, in this, on this sort of um, map on the square, went to each of those nine points. So this has sort of got a massive overtone of psychogeography, the kind of derive approach, uh, the idea that, um, of, of drawing some kind of artifice on a map and then going to each of those points. Uh, and I went to each of these points and then did another sample at each of these. So this is uh, another photo of some of the hills near Khuya that was one of the points on the map. And you can see the square, the bottom left corner. So you can see uh, the quadrat there. Uh, this is another photo, one of the almond fields. Um, almond fields? Almond fields, I think, uh, nearby. So I again sort of had my square that I um, sampled uh, the soil and took a photo of the ground in that square uh, and you can see another square here at the bottom of the photo this is some of the foresty area near nearby and each of these squares has a sort of biological scientific sense of it uh, there's a there's a technique which is called quadrat sampling um, and you can essentially throw a square a meter square and look at everything which is in that meter square and that was really what i was doing and this is the image of all nine squares. So the nine points on the map that I have sort of arbitrarily drawn, I then went to each of those squares and then took a photo of, of the ground beneath and, and sort of, you know, just almost celebrated that as a sample of the wildlife and the nature and the earth we had uh, in Hoya. So the questions, I guess, are what does this mean for me in my practice? Um, and I think uh, there are three sort of things that this gave me as an artist, um, as, as an MA student who was uh, on a residency, it's three things that it really get, gave me in terms of my practice. Uh, the first is it was a direct application to my MA degree show, which was a year later. The second is it's really helped me think about my, my sort of what I'm trying to do with my work, which is really about bridging, um, as Camilla mentioned at the beginning, the, the links between art, science and policy. And the third point is um, about bringing out a sense of sustainability and ephemerality in my practice. I'm going to go through each of those quickly. So this is my degree show. Um, you might already see some of the kind of obvious uh, links to what I was doing and figuring out for myself in Rier. So again, I went to nine points on a square. Um, the southwest part of that was King's Cross, Granary Square, where the, uh, the degree show was. And I went to, the, to nine points in, in, in a mile, uh, sorry, not a mile, um, 10 miles uh, each side of the square um, and I went to places like godforsaken places like Stratford and Waltham Abbey and uh, Epping and Cruise Hill, uh, Hainault and I went to each of these places and instead of sort of taking a photo of the ground uh, as I had in um, Spain I actually dug up the ground so I dug up the soil and, and um, I was really interested in the soil geology uh, a bit like um, that piece that Simon showed towards the end of his presentation, sort of similar um, idea. So I dug up the, the soil and I brought that to King's Cross, uh, to Granary Square, and brought that into my degree show. Um, and um, you can see that here. I created these tablets out of the soil, the, 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 the ground in each of those locations. And this was like this sense of, um, it really kind of, Got me interested in this idea of data um, about like what data looks like, what data feels like, um, and almost you know sort of getting into these ideas about whether the public and whether people trust data or whether you really need to sort of see it to believe it and and almost like touch it and almost smell the data. So that was kind of where I was getting with that. And you can probably see the, the read across into my wider practice where I got really interested in um, how 
the, the relationship between art, science and politics. And what do I mean by that? So I guess a, a couple of starting points are we know, we know about things like post-truth uh, and this sort of this questioning of the value of the of expertise and the role of scientists. And I think that's related to some other things like the growth of digital information and data. Some of the points that Matt's talked about earlier really resonates with this, things like globalization, the kind of increasing complexity of society. Um, citizens are feeling dislocated from policy making. So my response, partly informed by my work at data, has been to to make the data real, to, to make it interactive, to make it tangible, something you can visualize, something you can touch and feel. And I should say that at the degree show, uh, when I had this, I did catch a few people like poking at these little tablets, um, which they were then horrified when, I, when they realized I was the artist. I was like, what are you doing? Um, but it, it was kind of cool. They really wanted to like touch the, like, touch the data, kind of thought that was pretty cool. Um, so yes, that was the second sort of big implication of my work at um, Prier. And a third point, oh sorry, I should say this is a um, piece, the, the, the image here is a piece of work that I'm currently working on, uh, which is exploring, uh, uh, further exploring the role of um, art in policy making with some funding from the AHRC and the Claw Leadership Scheme. Uh, it's a um, 3D interactive visualisation of climate change in Bangladesh. Um, so you can see more of this work on my website. Um, but yeah, the third thing that the work in Hoya really gave me um, it was a sense of improving the sustainability of my practice. So um, the, the work in, in Hoya was like literally photos of the ground, um, you know, the, the actual like the soil and, and nothing more than that. And, and um, I know that Heather Barnett uh, went to um, Hoya, so she's the, one of the MA teachers on the, um, the MA Art and Science. And she looked for the, the pieces that I'd made and they'd gone, they disappeared, they'd melted back into the landscape. And that sort of gave me a real satisfactory um, sense. Uh, sense. Uh, those um, those um, earth tablets that I showed in the previous uh, couple of slides, you know, they all dissolve into the ground again. Um, and the, the, um, the uh, I've worked in wood since um, Hoya, uh, and the, um, the uh, piece on, the glass piece on Bangladesh, that was also um, built using uh, old Greenhouses, so bits of old greenhouses that I went into lot allotments and cleared out for people, and then turned that into artwork. So it's really give but one of the, the sort of legacies of Hoya is not just informing maybe the conceptual side of my practice uh, and the material side, but also the sustainability of my practice. So I think that's it from me. Um, you can follow and find out more from me on my website. But perhaps it's over to Camilla to facilitate some questions now. Thank you so much. Um... Um, starting from Simon for the uh, overview on the um, Hoya uh, project. It was really interesting to know uh, to know more about all the new initiatives uh, that you're bringing to the site. Thank you, Matt and Stephen, for your account of your experience there, and um, and also to explain the legacy and the impact that that experience had on your. Um, on your uh, practice. Um, so um, we can um, open up to the audience for questions. Uh, we can use the chat box, um, as we said at the beginning, or if you want to ask your questions in person, you can just raise your hand um, and can be unmuted. Um, there is a question that is very specific um, about the MA Art and Science students uh, coming to Hoya. So maybe we can um, go back to this um, in the chat. Simon, do you want to quickly respond to that question? Can, can anyone apply and go to Hoya um, in the uh, future? Uh, how is the situation at the moment considering um, COVID-19? Well, the situation as it is as it is everywhere, it's um, you know as bad in Spain as it is in the U.S. Um, hopefully, as the vaccine rolls out and things are a little bit more open, we can start accepting resident artists again. All you need to do is go to the Hoya Air um, website, go to the application, and apply there. Is it worth saying, Simon, that you know there's obviously a scheme that goes through um, the the AER, so that Lucy and Camilla are organising. But there's like you can just you don't have to go through that scheme. People just apply directly to you. So there's sort of both approaches yes. work. Clarify that. Yes, you can apply directly to um, um to a residency with us. Um, it's scrutinised just as it would be if you applied through the AER. 
residency program. We have a question from Taro um, who says, what are some of the things that you look for in successful applications? Um, we decided a few years ago now that really we weren't going to be arbiters of what our people make when they get here or what they do in their personal practice anyway. We're looking for uh, a professional presentation and a really a, a good website uh, with a good CV. We need to know that you've interacted with others to, in the projects you work with. Um, other than that, we, we are quite quite open. I found it um, I found it really liberating when I arrived in, um, uh, and met Simon. And you know, he was sort of saying, "There's no expectation about what you're what you you don't know like, have to." have produced something, we're not going to test it at the end of this um, two weeks. It's really, a, it's, a, it's almost like more of a process and how it relates to outcomes that you might, you know, you might, might only realise sort of months and years later. Uh, and I found that like a really liberating process. It wasn't like you had to come there and do something and then, you know, you were marked on it. It was a sort of bit of more of a mature approach. A question uh, for Stephen and Matt, really, um, just because of in recent months, well, maybe a year, we've had to adapt to technology and there's so many different things coming about from that. Um, when you went to Hoya, did you, has it influenced your practice now in avoiding using technology as much and how are you finding it now since COVID? I'm, I'm here right now in this conversation and I think that's pretty much a good indicator of how most of my days are spent. It's like looking at various different platforms and having conversations sometimes with people um, and um, I don't know I mean I think for me going on this opportunity to sort of uh, think of like an alternative an alternative environment where I was not so connected to things um, this kind of continues to be something that I think about I mean I, I guess like Stephen said like the, the experience of the of the um, residency is something that just keeps giving Two weeks isn't really that long a period of time, um, but it's enough time to get like to kind of uh, to change to change like to help you sort of rethink or or think differently, but not enough time to really kind of produce work. Um, and now it's a year where I'm trying to think differently, <laughs> um, but, I, but I I can't. I seem completely. Uh, I mean, I'm I'm I don't know. I'm rambling a bit here, but basically I'm completely lost at the moment. Uh, it's really hard uh, having a having a rubbish time, <laughs> uh, and I'm um, kind of very much reliant on this technology that's here because um, because that's the that's those are the things that, that have been presented to us, I guess, as a way of coping. It's almost a relief to hear you say that because as a well, I work at UAL, but also a practitioner, and I'm sure there's so many practitioners here um, in the audience today, and. I mean, it is mutual. It's a struggle that everyone is having. Um, so it's good to come together to discuss these things, you know. Stephen, did you have something to add? Yeah, I, I, could I um, address uh, Patrick's question in the chat, which I, I love. It's a great, really lovely question. Um, so it's, I think my understanding of it is almost like, you know, does, a, does an artist have to sort of make stuff and create something new? Um, and it actually gets it gets a little bit to Lemmy's point as well about sustainability. Um, and I just think it's a really interesting um, dilemma and tension. Uh, and I think a lot of artists um, are really like given a lot of satisfaction and, and sort of enjoyment by making something and then sort of putting it up on a pinnacle and people looking at that. Uh, and actually, I think that's that for me has been really helpful way for me to get through lockdown as well is, is is making stuff it's been just a real um therapy in some respects but you have this sort of tension where you know artists just are one of the many groups of people in this world who are just making stuff that's going to be there when we're all when humanity is gone we're just kind of contributing to all the crap in the world um and i think it's a really interesting point and and i think Often when, I don't know about others, uh, you, you know, you all have your own experiences, but often when I'm making art, I realise actually that I'm there when I've stripped away a lot of the, the, the sort of crap and it's actually got very simple. And that was really my process in Hoya, how I ended up with just a, a circle on the ground, you know, and a photo of, of, of the ground below that. And it, it was almost like sort of stripping away so much until it got to this 
things which for me was really beautiful so patrick i love your question and i would just sort of say that that feels like a really interesting thing to probe like this tension between making things creating things and almost like getting out of the picture and, and allowing the environment to speak for itself and, and not contributing more to humanity's like legacy on, in this world and Simon, maybe you want to um, respond uh, partly to Lemmy's questions. I don't know if you saw it in the chat. Um, we saying, I would like to ask what you think are other, I'm missing that, other things that artists can do other than awareness to assist progression towards a more sustainable circular economy. From your perspective as an artist, but also as a um, residency host, yeah, if I understand the question correctly, I would say that a fine art education, and, and I was eight years in fine art education, um, it gives you a, a, a professional skill at the end of it, which doesn't have any boundaries. So I've been able to turn myself to many things over the years, having studied, is learning not to distinguish between what you want to do as an environmental activist, what your research might be, and what your personal practice might be. The whole things are, are integrated and, and boundless. So in that respect, I think we contrib we're contributing to a circular economy in, in our instance, because we're not actually taking anything from the environment other than what is given freely to it. And we're not, we're not either polluting at the same time. Can I, can I jump in there? Because um, I, 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 when I um, went to visit Simon, I was really interested in, in the kind of I think conscious blurring between, you know, your work uh, as an artist, your work almost, I don't know if you have any design background, but kind of almost thinking about your uh, state in a, in a sort of design or like architectural sense. Um, and then also thinking of it from a deeply ecological sense as well. And I kind of quite liked how, you know, you almost didn't make a distinction between the, wearing those hats. And, and you've put stuff on your website, um, I think that shows some of your, um, some of the groundworks, but it's done in quite an artistic style. I really love the way that you mingle those, those sort of ways of thinking. And I don't know if you think that that gives you quite a lot or is it's helped unlock maybe some technical challenges by using a kind of artistic way of thinking? Uh, constant challenges. That's one of the reasons a fine art education doesn't teach you how to do some of the things that you need to learn and, and to make mistakes in at the same time. But also I think, you know, obviously we're concerned with aesthetics as artists and whatever you do, um, you feel your way and, 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 and conform to that aesthetic sensibilities that you understand where you look at the world around you. At the same time, you've also not got to be an artist and just want complete control over everything. Um, just to follow up on that again, so um, Lemmy, I've put a, a um, link in the chat, but I think this, this idea about thinking about what an artist's role is in in things like sustainability. I mean, there's other issues as well that you might look at. You might look at equality. Um, you know, there, there's a number of areas you might think, well, what is the artist's role? Is it about raising awareness? That's something I think that artists do do often, but could you look at other sort of um, roles that artists might play? Uh, I've, um, I'm right quite a lot of that on that at the moment, um, and I've put a link to that. Um, but I think it's a really interesting thing to think about. Um, and so I, what, what I like about what Simon does is he, he is getting into more of the doing and using art sort of to doing sense, not just the raising awareness side of things, he's actually using art to show solutions. Well, if I can add to that, I think um, this collaboration we have with the um, Alternative Photography Collective is going to be rather, a rather special thing because I think the collaboration and building bridges especially post-Brexit between the UK and Spain and the rest of Europe is a, a very crucial thing that we do. Because, you know, another experience I think most people take from art school is they learn from their peers as much as they do anybody else, uh, as in terms of the academic staff. You know, I think that's a really important thing that could be lost a little bit over the next year or so with COVID. But um, hopefully through mediums like this, this will recover. But I think you can still build bridges with other organisations and individuals despite the restrictions that we've got. I think that's important. 
I have a question, Simon, um, for you. It's a quite um, it's a practical question because such a, uh, Hoya is such a wonderful project mm -hmm. um, and uh, and very independent. So um, I'm wondering how you mm -hmm. survive in terms of uh, you know finances and funding um, to run all these uh, incredible activities uh, with you know not commercial impact. Mm -hmm. uh, I understand your um, almost um, self-sufficient, but I guess there are costs attached to running um, such a project. There are, but we made the decision a few years ago not to be a kind of organization that is <clears throat> running around looking for funding from different organizations and different sort of governmental bodies or whatever else. We decided if we can do this, then we must do it completely independently. And, and not to be dependent on that funding. Um, obviously, when artists attend um, the residency, there's a fee to cover their accommodation and food, but we keep that about the same price as a hostel in Granada, which is incredibly cheap, really. Um, so we rely on a lot of artists coming through our doors and stuff. Um, so this is how we fund ourselves, basically. So uh, I. I don't know, Stephen, if you're aware of the Artist Placement Group. Um, this uh, project set up by Barbara Steveni in the mid 60s, um, along with Jonathan Latham, uh, the guy that uh, lives in Flat Time House, John Latham. Um, this is like a project to, to kind of uh, integrate artists into um, the kind of bureaucratic machinations of uh, various different institutional facilities, bodies, uh, government spaces. Uh, businesses and organizations as a way to see what uh, what an artist's presence within these places might do in terms of the um, like differences to policy making or um, or just kind of generally creating different types of work cultures and whether that was something that um, like is is that kind of uh, like similar sort of foundation to the kind of thing that you're you're kind of you're thinking of in what you're doing now um, you know like the what is the role of the artist, and can it sort of uh, can can one be be of use within these different types of uh, environments that in some, in some way that is more than just um, kind of the dissemination of ideas or consciousness we're raising, which is I guess how you have described what most art seems to do. Yeah, it's a super interesting it's a super interesting bit of history. So this is um, a scheme set up in the sixties. I've just put a link to it in chat. Uh, but about yeah, getting artists into some real kind of bureaucracies. I think they kind of they they went into the um, the treasury, but also things like the coal board or the water board, and and almost a kind of precursor of some of the artist in residency schemes that we see running up till today. Um, I, I've I've always been interested in this actually. But I've never had time to really get into the research on it. So Matt, I will, I will follow up with you and just um, sounds like you know more about it than me. So I'll have a chat with you about it. Um, but yeah, really interesting bit of history. I think in addition, you should consider when you're applying to residencies uh, where the residency funding does come from as well. Because obviously it would be ironic um, to attend a residency that, um, that shouts about its sustainability and ethical responsibility if it's been sponsored by, I don't know, an oil company or something as well. We've recently, uh, I should say that Hoya is in two parts. Hoya Air, as, as I said, go to food and accommodation, but Hoya Air here is um, a not-for-profit association. Um, we've recently been uh, had some donations coming from the States, which is absolutely fantastic. But you've got to be very cautious where you take your money from as well. It's something that needs to be considered. Wasn't there, isn't there a, um, a residency as part of the AER, which is in a glass bottle factory, uh, Camilla or Abbey? I'm sure I saw, um, uh, I'm sure I saw a video on this at the show that you ran at, in Bo a few years ago. Um, yes, no, it wasn't. It was um, the host was the Berengo Studios in Venice. Mm -hmm. So the artist decided to, you know, they facilitated the artist being um working with this uh, uh glass bottle um manufacturer but it was yeah the glass the glass the Brengo glass studios 
Yeah, it was a fantastic piece of art, the, um, the video they made. And it kind of gets into some really, it gets into these really interesting questions about, you know, about embedding artists in these quite bureaucratic, quite process heavy institutions. Simon, notwithstanding all those points you made about, you know, who's paying for what and what's the interests of the different organisations. I think it's a really interesting piece to get into. Um, I might sort of follow up on that, um, that piece of art in that glass studio. It's really, really cool. Yeah, well, I mean, I was about Tate, uh, Tate Gallery, and of course, uh, I'm not being controversial here, but the Tate Gallery has been funded by uh, BP, I believe, recently. Uh, I don't know if they're de disinvesting in that, but also, you know, Tate is Tate and Lyle. It comes from it comes from slavery. You know, we mustn't forget these bits, a little bit of history. So there is a question mm -hmm. for Matt. Um, <laughs> From Patrick. Yes, I'm working or, or I have been working um, or worked on uh, not so much the concepts of the cloud, but more about um, the uh, the kind of physical infrastructures of, uh, of, of, of media, of digital media. Um, and there is a six part documentary series that I produced called The People's Cloud, which is uh, uh, here's a link that you can pick up there, Patrick, um, perhaps uh, take a look at that if you're interested in this kind of uh, area, it's sort of information about, um, well, it's, it's kind of a combination of like interviews and kind of, uh, sort of abstract sound collages uh, with experts that work in the uh, sort of internet industry as well as commentators on the industry talking about the struggles of the internet. Um, it's a few years old now and the technology moves at a rapid rate so some of it might be a little bit out of date i suppose um but yeah check it out thanks for asking i know we're running out of time but i just um, thought phil uh, barton has put a great point in the chat which talks about the restrictions that you face in somewhere like Hoyer, where you can't just pop to the local art shop and pick up a, a can of paint if you've forgotten it um and um yeah i, I totally agree with that almost by by sort of restricting what we could do and um, what you have access to, it really forces a more kind of creative response. And that, that's actually a technique that I think they use on the MA Art Science quite a lot. Um, uh, but it definitely is something that I experienced in Hoyer and, and led to some really interesting outcomes, which I wouldn't have thought that was going to happen uh, before I'd arrived. Thank you. I think I think we need to wrap it up now. Uh, we're running out of time. Um, you all shared your um, contact details and websites. So if there there are any further questions, people can get in touch directly with you. Um, the um, the conversation is being recorded and will be available at some point. Abby will circulate the link. Thank you, Stephen, for um, finding the link to Naomi's uh, piece in, uh, in Murano. You're very quick at finding links, amazing. Um, so thank you again, Simon, Matt, Stephen, very nice to reconnect you. Um, and, um, and yeah, and uh, we can be in touch if we have any, any questions or any other comments. Thank you, everyone, and I'll Thank see you, you next for the next appointment. Thank you. Take care. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.